often um, it's called gender variant or gender non-conforming children. This is how they're sort of labeled. Um, what was it? What else was I going to say about this? Yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Questions about that? Comments? Add to? Okay. There were some different things in the popular media over the last several years, especially with uh, Caitlin coming out and going through. And what we will say when you see M to F, what does that mean? Male to female. Male to female. You guys know all this already, right? And um, F to M. Yeah, right. So there was uh, there was an individual here. Um, he actually wrote this book, Labor of Love, so he was able to actually conceive and get pregnant. So because he was uh, F to M, or a female to male, had a uterus, had fallopian tubes, had ovaries, had all the internal structures, um, went through hormone therapy and breast reduction surgery and all that, but still maintained the uterus and the vagina so could actually conceive through IVF, so was able to have a baby. Um, there was actually Chad Bono, that was several years ago. I don't you guys know Cher, right? Cher the singer, performer, amazing. That's actually um, her son. And then there's some other transsexuality that's been in popular media. There's a lot of things that have been in the popular media. This is reassigned, it's sort of an artistic project by a photographer, Claudia Gonzalez, just showing sort of male to female and female to male, different um, gender, transgender individuals. Um, sexual orientation, so if we want to keep this separate, transgender is the gender identity, right, or trans, sexual orientation of transgender individuals. That's been looked at in several different studies now. So about 60% of male to female or MTF trans are attracted to men. So this is looking at just specifically sexual orientation. 95% of F to M, or female to male, trans individuals are attracted to females, okay? So these are just overall based on several different studies. About 10% of trans individuals are bisexual. Note that this is similar to cisgender individuals. It's the same, very almost the same rate for the most part, about 10%, so about one out of 10 uh, bisexual. Many trans individuals used to do hormonal replacement or hormonal treatment. I would say it's, a lot of times it's not called HRT because it's not hormonal replacement. It's hormonal therapy or HT. You can use either term. But really we use HRT for things like postmenopausal women that at one time had high estrogen but now it's gone. And so they use replacement therapy to give the estrogen back. Um, so some trans individuals will do hormonal treatment, so either androgens or estrogens, right, to either masculinize or feminize parts of the body. Um, some will do sex change operations. It's the most common in male to females. Um, so I'm going from male to female is easier than female to male and constructing a penis. So that surgery is actually more difficult um, to do. I will warn you, there's some, there's some sort of graphic images that I have in here just so to sort of illustrate some of this process. But I do want you to realize that trans individuals, even more so or at least the same amount as other members of LGBTQ community, face a lot of difficult, uh, Stigma, comments, behavior, harassment, oppression. Uh, there's a lot of heterosexism, okay? Everywhere, everywhere you go, there's heterosexism. And what's heteronorm, it's made sort of a heteronormativity situation. So a lot of suicide rates are higher in trans individuals. And actually, depression rates are higher in trans, and also in the LGBTQ community in general, but especially in trans individuals. Those rates are high. So I'm gonna send you later on after this exam and we're worried about all those different things. I'll send you a short little clip I have of documentaries where it actually, they discuss this and there's individuals that give you their firsthand perspective and sort of share. And I really like those, so I'm gonna send those to you. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you knew, like, because I've done like, a little bit of research on like sex change operations and like, I know like the M to F operation is a lot more advanced Mm -hmm. than the F to M yep. operation, and I was just wondering if you knew why. It's very difficult based on the anatomy of the male and female body. So it's easier to remove an appendage than to reconstruct a whole brand new appendage, right? So, and I'll show you what that looks like in just a minute. So hopefully you're not totally offended and, you know, by this, but some of the, this actually shows that's the most common in going M to F 
the surgical reconstruction of the genital, that sex change operation, is the most common. I will say a lot of, of, of people who identify as trans don't ultimately do this. Many do not because, you know, do you think this is cheap? It's absolutely not cheap. You've got to be on hormone therapy for a while. Then you have to go through getting enough money to be able to do this. And do you think insurance supports this? No, insurance doesn't support this. This is upwards of $80,000 to $120,000 to have this surgery. So this is as much as like a house in the middle of America. Okay, it's really, really expensive. So it's hard to be able to actually have the funds to be able to do this. This kind of just goes over in general, the M to F. So basically it's cutting, pulling back, cutting all that away, leaving sort of a blind opening, which becomes a vaginal introitus or opening. Stitching, remember we all have sort of the labial scrotal swellings. So it's removing the, all the tissue of sort of the penis and the scrotum and then bringing it back together to create the labia and sort of a blind vaginal pouch. This surgery is easier to do, to answer your question, than actually constructing a penis. They can do it, and some places, some clinicians are getting better and better at those technologies, but it's still lagging behind, it's harder to do. Based on the anatomy, it's harder to do, and have it be functional, okay? There's also, so ultimately it ends up the M to uh, F, overall reconstruction or sex change operation. Also there's breast, so there's breast reduction. Those are simpler to do. There's still surgeries and not without risk, but they're easier to do in that you can reduce that tissue, remove the fat, remove the, the lobules of the breast tissue and close it off. So those are easier actually to do than the actual sex change operation or when we're talking about the external genitals. Okay, so I'm gonna send you the, some of those little videos though that I'd like you to watch later after our exam, after we have this next exam. So is there a biological and or genetic basis to sexuality? Okay, so this, is, this comes up a lot in a lot of different circles, and I know just based on sort of social context of where you're at, I've had this discussion with many different people in my life, friends, family, students, other colleagues, just all over the place, of asking that question, is it to do with nature versus nurture, or some, some combination of both? And I will get a lot of people saying, well, you know, it's a choice. And I think we're all, I think most people realize it's, it's not a choice, really. It's not a choice. It's, you know, it's one of those things. It's like no more than, you know, some people love chocolate. Some people love vanilla, right? You just, it is what it is. Like, you can't, I can't change that. I can't go, oh, no, that's not my taste. I, I don't like that. I like this. You can't, you can't really do that. So for me, I'm going to give you a series of experiments and studies that show that there's a biological basis to sexuality. So there's a lot of genetic studies on human sexuality. And hopefully by the end of this, you will be able to sort of rephrase or recapture some of these studies and to give evidence of, yeah, this is why there are uh, genetic or biological evidence to show that that's where sexuality is, is coming from, at least partially. Homosexuality runs in families, okay? So there are families that have higher rates of homosexuality, male and female. There are studies of identical and fraternal twins. They first did them in 1991, and then they repeated in lots of subsequent years. If one identical twin is homosexual, there's a 52% chance that the other will be, okay? And even if these twins are separated, okay? Yes. 22% there'll be a fraternal twin will be. Fraternal twins, how do they result? Two different eggs. Two different eggs, and actually some women will ovulate more than one egg, boop, boop, or from the same ovary. They'll have two graphene follicles. If they're both in the oviducts and they both get fertilized by this swimming sperm, you'll have two babies <laughs> developing in the uterus, bless you, at the same time. That's fraternal twins. Identical twins happens when the early one cell, two cell, four cell embryo splits in two and then keeps dividing separately and then implants. Sometimes they share an amniotic sac and a placenta, sometimes they don't, they're in separate. But genetically, they are exactly the same for the most part. Okay, there's some little epigenetic studies where there's a little bit of differences, but. So 22% chance the fraternal twin will be homosexual as well, 11% the adopted brother will be. So there's about a one out of 10 likelihood if they're adopted and there's no genetic relations. So you can see these numbers are high and they go low. The more distantly or non-genetically related they are giant twin studies in Sweden. Europe has done a lot of different studies on sexuality and twin studies, and they get huge populations. They have giant sample sizes. They found genetics accounted for 34 to 37% of male homosexual behavior, 19% of lesbian behavior, 
shared family environment accounted for only 0% males, so there was absolutely nothing coming from a shared family environment in these twin studies, and 16% accounted for shared family environment in females. So again, these numbers much higher, looking at the actual genes and genetics that are associated, or the link to genes of these different um, twi uh, twin studies. So there's also been some other genetic studies. There is a region on the X chromosome, it's XQ28, Right down here, here's the short arm of the X chromosome, here's the long arm of the X chromosome. X28 is down at the bottom. Way early in the early 90s, it was identified a cluster of genes here as possible sort of homosexual or gay genes. Because individuals that had this particular sequence of clustered genes here tended to have higher rates of homos uh, homosexuality. So there was maternal linkage in families of gay men. So on the maternal side, X chromosome, right? So. 33 out of 44 fraternal gay brothers shared this XQ28 genes, this set of sequences in those genes on XQ28. So that's about 75% of the brothers that were gay had that cluster on the X chromosome. Only three out of 12 heterosexual brothers shared them, so about 25% of them actually shared those. So again, the numbers are higher. So notice these sample sizes are not huge either. So that's something we have to be aware of. This is a particular study looking at a certain demographic, and the sample sizes are not in the thousands. There's been some subsequent studies uh, that found linkage with XQ28 and, and homosexual, homosexuality, and then other studies did not. So conflicting. Yep, it is there. These individuals have it. It's correlated. It's like 75% correlation. These, not. Nah, it wasn't there. So that's still sort of verdict out, I think. There's conflicting results based on the studies. Children raised by, so this is genetic evidence again for human sexuality. Children raised by homosexual couples, you might wonder about this. I know I've had friends that are kind of, well, what about kids that get adopted? Because I have a lot of gay and lesbian friends, and they actually went through IVF and have kids, right? So they are same-sex partners, parenting, and they have kids. You might wonder, does that affect the sexuality of the children, right? Because they're exposed now to gay parents or lesbian parents. Like, does that social nurture component outweigh the nature component, and I say no, it doesn't. It actually doesn't. They actually have the same likelihood of, uh, of being homosexual as kids raised in completely heterosexual uh, households where the parents are heterosexual. Okay, so that's another. Yes, this makes sense. Okay, uh, genetic males born with amb ambiguous genitalia. Okay, that you can't quite tell. They're more feminized or in between male and female external genitalia. When they're raised as girls, the majority are attracted to women when they grow up, despite being raised and seen as females by society. This is a lot of weight to say, biologically what's there from the beginning is not that heavily a race shaped or molded by societal treatment of that individual. And we've already talked about an example like this, and what is that example? We talked about sex development, uh, aberrations and, and developmental disorders that are there right congenitally from the very beginning. Do you remember something called guevidosis? Oh, yeah. Yes? Penis at 12 in Spanish? Guevidosis? Those individuals are genetically chromosomally males, but they have very ambiguous genitalia, so they're more like feminized on the outside. They are raised as females. At the time of puberty, when they get the surge of testosterone, growth of their body and their genitals, and then they sort of transform and they're accepted as males. The majority of those, almost all of those, are attracted to females, and they take on the male gender role. And their sexuality is heterosexual in those cases. So even though they're raised as girls, does that make sense? So they're raised as females and treated as females by family and society. So here's where I put that, rabidosis males, they have the five alpha reductase deficiency, they have the feminized genitalia and undescended testes, they're raised as girls, they're masculinized at puberty, their body grows, the penis grows, they have a heterosexual orientation and they're attracted to women, the vast majority. Okay, does this make sense? Yes? Okay, so I feel like some of this gets very nook and cranny. It gets into the genes that are lost and the congenital things that we talked about. This is what I want you to sort of take as the take home for this part. Being raised as a girl with all those social influences does not appear to override the genes and the organizational imprint, organizational, right, effects of androgens like testosterone during fetal development. So it doesn't matter. Their brains and their bodies were already exposed to that in utero. 
Yes? That's talking about the gliboidosis yes. still? Yes. Okay. Yep. That's one of the best examples to actually look at this and see that that's true. Socialization doesn't get rid of it. There's other theories of abnormal hormone exposure during fetal development. So we know there are studies that actually have found that hormone disruptions or imbalance or differences leads to feminization or masculination, masculinization of the brain or body parts. So decreased testosterone exposure in utero feminizes the male brain, and this happens in animals and in humans. So if there's lowered testosterone exposure, it is not organizing the brain and the body parts with the normal androgen pathway, so it becomes feminized. There are attributes that are more feminized in these individuals. Some studies have found that gay men do have certain brain differences and feminized areas. I, sh I showed you some of those differences when we talked about brain sex differences in looking at different populations of individuals and how their brain regions and neurons have some slight differences. Um, there was a discovery of brain differences in the bed nucleus of the, it's called the striad terminalis. It's in the hypothalamus, so it's a nucleus in the hypothalamus. Found that they're smaller or more feminized in half of male to female transsexuals that were studied in this particular study. So that this particular nuclei in the hypothalamus was actually feminized or smaller. So it's looking at brain differences in transgender individuals and comparing it to non-trans. So that area we know is actually involved in sexual behavior in rats. So it's a sexual behavior where it's similar to the lordosis that we talked about in cats. That behavior in the brain of the hypothalamus is linked to sexual behavior in other certain animals. So this abnormal hormone exposure, sons and pregnant mothers exposed to high stress. So if a woman has high levels of stress, high epinephrine levels, high cortisol levels, um, and they're exposed to a lot of high stress, they end up having decreased testosterone by the fetal testes and also increased rates of homosexuality. These are certain studies looking at sort of high levels of cortisol and uh, stress hormones coming from the brain and the adrenals on a baby in utero or fetal development in utero. Also, genetic males, so in, they have XY, right? Genetic males with complete androgen insensitivity syndrome. Do you remember this one? Mm -hmm. CAIS. Many women that have this or fall into this uh, group, they actually call it testicular feminization syndrome. That's another word for it, TFS. It's the same thing, TFS, testicular feminization syndrome. They cannot respond to testosterone. They don't have normal testosterone receptors. Chromosomally XY, okay, so you would say biologically male, chromosomally male, based on their sex, right? But they can't respond to testosterone. They lack a normal testosterone receptor. It's mutated. Uh, they look at these. Most of these individuals identify as female, as women, and most of them are attracted to males, okay? So chromosomally male, phenotypically female. Daughters of pregnant women that are treated with, this was a, a drug, diethylstilbestrol. We know now that this causes all kinds of negative effects and even affects fertility and embryo development. But women that were treated with this as a drug, they actually increased the incidence of bisexual or homosexual behaviors. So women exposed to high levels of, D, of DES. Another example is congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So I went over this one as well, CAH. Adrenal hyperplasia, so overgrowth of the adrenal glands starting in the fetus. So while the individual is developing in the uterus, in fetal development, there's high androgen exposure by the fetal adrenal cortex. And remember it makes androgens. One of those androgens is DHEAS, dihydroepiandrosterone. This is back in the uh, sex development slides. About a third of these have homosexual attraction as adults. So Condrenal CAH are actually XX, right? So chromosomally female, but then phenotypically they're masculinized based on the genitalia, the mammary glands, body hair, and body proportions due to androgens during fetal development. Okay, so androgens during fetal development actually masculinizes the brain and the body of these individuals. Okay, so there's another component here, and this is another element Studies that have looked at finger length, and it's been controversial because some yes. studies find that yes. it always holds up. And if you have, I'm sorry yes. to interrupt you, I read that if you have a, uh, a longer ring finger, you are at higher risk for anorexia. That might be true. I haven't seen that one. I haven't seen that. We'll come back to that. But other biological studies have found that there's a 2D4D ratio. Now, this doesn't always hold up, 
But it is one of those factors that is correlated, and I'll show you how it's correlated. Everybody's gonna be looking at your fingers in just a second. 40, the 2D40 ratio is your pointer finger is digit two, your ring finger is digit four, I can't even hold the both, the two up, right? So digit two and four. It's the pointer finger, ring finger length ratio. So which one is bigger, longer than the other one? Here's a little array of how these typically correlate. Not always, but there's a common correlation. Heterosexual males tend to have the second digit shorter than the fourth. So the ring finger is longer, okay? Uh, homosexual males, typically two and four digits are equal or two is a little bit longer. Hetero female, two and four tend to be equal, okay? Or in this case here it shows equal or uh, a little bit longer. Uh, gay or lesbian female, two is smaller than four. So four is actually longer and it's shown right here with red. So this one's longer, <laughs> homosexual man, the pointer finger's longer, hetero, the, the ring finger is longer. And then heterosexual women, they're about the same. They're about the same. Now everybody's like looking at your fingers. All right, now you want this, this hocus pocus. So I always try to stick to the science-based facts, like evidence and studies that have been done well, we know we can compare. Do you think this is like real? No. no. I don't know why. <laughs> it's, it's sort of, there is a little bit of truth to it, and I'm going to show you how. There's a correlation between androgen levels, testosterone, in fetal development, and fetal finger bone growth. So that biologically, it actually comes from a real place, okay? And there's lots of studies looking at cute little mice, and also little humans. Developmental biologists, these individuals, Zane and Cone, did experiments on female mice. They modified the amounts of androgens they were exposed to in utero and as fetal development. They found it's not just the amount of fetal testosterone that determines that digit ratio, because they have the same thing, the two, four digit ratio, but it's the balance between testosterone and estrogen, how much that balance is. So mice with higher T or lower E had more male-like digit ratios and low T, D, 40 ratio. Mice with higher E or low T levels had more feminine digit ratios. Again, the high 2D40 ratio, so, so bigger or equal to with the 40. You have a longer ring finger, you're at more risk for ADD. More risk for ADD. So there are... If you have more finger, you're probably going to have a pressing So there's a lot of other little correlations. I, but I, I'll just leave it there. That it, This doesn't always hold up. This doesn't always hold up, but hello. This doesn't always hold up, but it is associated with androgen levels during fetal development. So, oftentimes it will correlate. Oftentimes it will correlate because it's expression of androgen during fetal development. All right, so study. If you have any questions, come by my office.